Good evening from our headquarters in Kyiv. This is The Sunday Show at Romansk International, the only prime time TV program explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm in English, and I'm Natalia Humenyuk. And that's what we have prepared for you tonight. After almost five years, the bridge connecting the only crossing point with the occupied Luhansk region of Ukraine is restored. Ukrainian parliament supported the bill on land reform on the first reading. What's next? We discuss with the MPs. MH17 joint investigation team published phone intercepts proving Russia's involvement in the Donbas war. The Bellingcats' Arik Toller provides the details. At the six years anniversary of the Euromaidan revolution, Ukrainians show their solidarity with the Hong Kong protesters. So is, as you see, it's quite a full program, but we start with something which really matters uh, symbolically, but not just. Uh, this week, finally, after almost five years, there had been the bridge restored between the occupied uh, Luhansk region. We can see it on the map, that is a bridge in Stanitsa Luhanska, and it happens to be the only crossing point in the Luhansk region. Uh, so far the cars couldn't go, so it was just the uh, ones for those who were crossing without the cars. Uh, that was the initiative, we can say, from the new Ukrainian government uh, after the re-election of the President Zelensky. It had been promised in July uh, and in June to be built within summer, yet it taken longer. Of course, uh, the bridge had been destroyed in uh, March 2015. Since then, there were numerous negotiations. The Ukrainian side didn't really uh, very and the, and the separatists didn't very much agree on the how uh, on the width of the bridge. Uh, so there was a huge discussions, but there was a huge also the problems for the local populations. We see that the president Zelensky traveled to the opening of the bridge. There were also a number of the foreign diplomats, um, and we also can uh, look at the short report uh, from our correspondent from Stanitsa Luhansk. On this side of the new bridge in Stanitsa Luhanska, people are waiting for the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, to open the bridge. There are dozens of representatives of Ukrainian and international media. On the other side, there are Russian and Luhansk media representatives, as well as the so-called foreign minister of the so-called Luhansk People's Republic. It appears to me that the officials of Ukraine and the unrecognized republic have never been this close to each other. I think this bridge is a very significant mission that shows that we don't just want to do things, we actually do them. We saw some unnecessary flags when we got here. Ukraine has nothing to do with this, but I think it will be our task for the near future to remove them and to build a new, normal, modern road of the same quality as the Mariupol Zaporizhia road. We have with us on Skype Stefan Sionan, which, who is the French journalist from Le Figaro here in Ukraine. Uh, Stefan, good to hear from you. Do you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you very good. So, uh, Stefan, uh, as I understand, you've been to the uh, Stanitsa when there was this opening, but also spent some days after the officials left, So, which is the most important moment to understand. Um, so explain us and our audience, um, how important is that, what people think, uh, and whether it matters or why it matters, if so. Oh yeah, actually it was very important for the people. I mean, I've been uh, heading in a rush to, to Stanitsa Luganska because the journalists have been um, announced in, in a pretty short notice that the bridge will be inaugurated and I took the last train to, Zil to Lizichansk to, to get to Donbass. And actually, uh, I'd like to underline something. The journalists were not as numerous as uh, the report is pretending because there were 
clearly Ukrainian journalists were covering such kind of uh, events. But I think I was the only foreign journalist who managed to, to, to get there just because it was something organized in last minute. And when I arrived in Lysychansk, I took the first marshal car to, uh, to go to Stanitsa Luganska, and the people didn't have really clear information. There were some rumors in the bus that Zelensky was coming, so it was pretty exciting for the people. But even on the spot, at the bus station of uh, Stanitsa Luganska, which is just behind the bridge, people were not very well informed that the president was coming. Just the novel started to spread in the beginning of the afternoon. And of course, the, the news that the, the bridge will be open started to, to spread among the people traveling between the two, uh, the two zones, between the LNR and between Ukrainian territories. So, as I understand also that the uh, they opened it a few days earlier than they planned, and we probably need to explain that there was restored bridge uh, for not for the cars early in the summer, and this is the bridge for the cars. But besides, you know, the moment of the opening, um, can you also explain why how people reacted on that? Besides, of course, it's a good thing, you know, you can't really challenge that. Uh, but what it matters, because also we, we can find it highly symbolic. There were from the other sides, the the separatist it uh, was just few meters uh, you know some dozens of meters between the the separatists and the ukrainian officials as well the foreign uh, diplomats yeah, I think the bridge has been finished in a rush because uh, just two days before the opening, I heard from very good sources on the ground that still 10, 15 meters had to be repaired. You have to know that the, dam the most damaged part of the bridge was from the Ukrainian side of the bridge. The structure from the separatist side on the other side of the bridge is kind of pretty stable from what we can see from drone images from, from the sky or even from the Ukrainian side. Um, the situation was like this. I mean, during four or five years, it was very difficult to cross the line between separatist-controlled territories and Ukrainian-controlled territories. You have to imagine that according to the local administration, every day between 10,000 and 15,000 people cross from one side to another. Most of those people are elderly people, are pensioners, most of them living in Lugansk territories and coming to the Ukrainian side, either for little businesses or to get their pensions on the Ukrainian side. But between 10 and 15,000 people a day, that's very important. And there were real questions of security because during the previous month, and yours, many people has, have been falling on those provisory stairs. The question of the weather, it was very disturbed. So what has been done actually in the past days and weeks, the bridge has been repaired, but it, it's a very, very tiny bridge. Only one car can cross this bridge. Two cars cannot cross each other. So basically it's a pedestrian bridge, but in case it's um, it's it's important to do it, um, some one car or one bus can cross. So all the people we've been meeting during this day thinks it's very important because it will increase the security for the people crossing on a daily basis. And uh, Stefan, uh, to be sure, of course now all the discussions, for instance, there would be the meeting in the, uh, in the Paris between the President Zelensky and the President Putin. So far we know that with the President of the German and French leaders. There are all these uh, quite uh, emotional discussions over the troops withdrawal. How it's all seen on the ground, you know, in when you stayed with the with the people there, just on the contact line? So from the diplomatic side, it was clearly uh, a peer operation of confidence building. The fact that the German ambassador and the French ambassador were siding very close to, to Zelensky was a sign that France and Germany wanted to back the president in this action. But also, the, Germany and France need to show some deliveries. G Germany and France have been very active, very proactive in the past three months to organize this meeting between Putin and Zelensky. On the same day, uh, Zelensky um, received on the as of sea in Ochakiv, the boats which have been uh, returned by Russia. So this is clearly a politic of small steps to, to build confidence before the meeting of the 9th of uh, December. Now, from the side of the population, it's something a little bit different. People are waiting 
to know what's going to happen. And one of the main reasons, and I've been really struck by this, it's something I knew, but, um, but after five years, Ukrainian media have no access in Stanitsa Luganska. I stayed overnight in Stanitsa Luganska. In the place I was sleeping in, there were 10 televisions on the TV. And there was not a single Ukrainian television. To get some information about what happened during that day in this very important city, I had to watch the first Russian television, and a television called Lugansk 24. It's a copycat of uh, Russia 24. And of course, those media were giving biased information to the people who were only watching this. And I understood that in Stanitsa Luganska, most of the people who watch the TV watch Russian news. Just young people take their news from internet. So they are basically a little bit more balanced than their parents and grandparents. But people are still waiting in a waiting position because they still don't know what's going to come next. And last thing that I'd like to mention, um, Stanitsa Luganska is a place of disengagement. But a few days before uh, the inauguration of the bridge, eight kilometers away from the beach, from, from the bridge, um, a Russian drone launched some explosive grenades and military positions of the Ukrainian army, wounding uh, an Ukrainian soldier. So there are the disengagement positions in Stanitsa, in Zolot, in Petrivsky, but it doesn't mean that the fights are stopping five or ten kilometers away from those positions. Thanks a lot. That was Stefan Sionan, who is the correspondent of the Le Figaro here in Ukraine, the French journalist. And um, we are moving uh, forward with the program, but I want to encourage you also to support our project and donate uh, as uh, this autumn we are also celebrating our five years and that was possible also uh, and could be possible further just with your support. <laughs> I would like us to be heard, not only in Ukraine, but all over the world. No bread for three months. What? Not one, but look how many. There's bread here and there. You are going against the God. Of course, point number one. Thanks for the invitation. When will this all end? The number of political prisoners has grown. Good evening from our headquarters in Kyiv. Ukrainian parliament supported the bill on land reform on the first reading. What's next? We discuss with the MPs. MH17 Joint Investigation Team published phone intercepts proving Russia's involvement in the Donbas war. The Bellingcats' Arik Toller provides the details. At the six years anniversary of the Euromaidan revolution, Ukrainians show their solidarity with the Hong Kong protesters. So the big story which is worthy to discuss is, of course, the opening of the land market here in Ukraine. And uh, for this, we have the discussion that was already mentioned in our program, but uh, we have the panel and uh, to understand what's going next. So we have Marian Zablotsky, who is the MP from the Servant of the People. Uh, also Volodymyr Tsabal, MP from the Holos Party, which didn't support the land reform in the first hearing. We will get to that. And as well, Dmitro Livch, who is a project manager, manager and the head of analytics as, is a business. So probably, uh, Marianne, the first question would be to you. Uh, on the November 13th, the uh, parliament supported the land reform. There were 400, uh, 247 votes. At that time, the other parties, opposition bloc, European Solidarity, but Kivshina, uh, for the future, didn't uh, or like uh, um, voted against the Holos party, uh, abstained mainly. Uh, what will ne what, what will happen next? What will you, would you change something? And what is the most important in this law for you? Well, first of all, we uh, Ukraine is currently the least uh, property rights protected country in Europe. We are ranking down in all of the ratings, and one of the reasons is this agricultural land sale ban, 
course, you can technically buy or sell land, but officially it's forbidden in Ukraine. So we are working on towards eliminating the worst property rights violation in Europe. Uh, yes, we finally did got 240 votes for, with 226 minimum for the land reform. And we finally moving towards cancelling the ban that was introduced back in 2001, introduced, by the way, by the Party of Communists, which clearly states uh, what, what we are fighting for. And yes, we had different positions from difficult political parties. Our political party, the ruling political party, that, of course, you should cancel the ban introduced by communists in 2001. We had a position from parties like Batkivshina, and we later found out from president that all they actually wanted, that they wanted to trade their position uh, in uh, respect that if we gave them, for example, the state grain expert in incorporation, they would relatively be so-so in terms of uh, voting uh, against the land sale reform. And of course, we had Holos, who I greatly respect, so we will which, uh, in my, which, in my opinion, voted against only because there were promises of significantly limiting the land reform towards the second reading. But we are cooperating relatively closely to make the reform as libertarian as possible. So, uh, of course, Vladimir, that's your chance to explain because it was for many confusing. Because, for instance, yes, the party like Batkivshina never supported it. Yulia Timoshenko was a strong she opponent. She did support that. In you know, in the, she introduced a law that yeah. introduced land reform to foreigners. I mean, so we expected that. Also, the solid European Solidarity, they said it should be, they voted against. The whole party also supported the land reform as an idea, but you abstained. So indeed, uh, until Monday before the voting, uh, so we were we were planning to to vote for. Uh, then several things happened. So actually, uh, just a step back. So in our program, we had uh, land reform. So we had uh, the elimination of uh, moratorium. So we were for that, and everyone knew that. Then uh, what happened? Uh, let's say a week uh, before two things. So first, uh, uh, during the uh, uh, budget process, uh, so we noticed that the program to support the ordinary farmers to finance the buying of land so was eliminated from the budget. So what does it mean? Less people would be able to get financing, I mean ordinary people, ordinary farmer, to buy land. And then second thing uh, that happened, this uh, interview of the president, uh, from the president about the referendum. So the, the referendum for the sale of the uh, land to the foreigners. Yeah, so we, we don't, so of course we understand that it's not popular in Ukraine and then we respect that and we were not, uh, uh, let's say, we were not uh, promoting that. But the fact that this uh, type of uh, mechanisms as referendum are used uh, for this type of questions like la land reform, that was, let's say, not uh, acceptable for us because in future this type of, uh, this, uh, let's say, referendum could be used for any question. Like, do we want, uh, I don't know, to increase taxes and, and so on and so forth. So after this, we actually uh, decided for ourselves that we want to, uh, let's say, uh, to wait and see. We wanted to actually, before the voting, we tried to, to remove several, let's say, unliberal uh, things from this uh, law we were not uh, successful and therefore we decided to abstain in order to give us time before the second reading to kind of to make sure that the law is the one that we want. So I encourage all participate and debate uh, but first uh, Dmitro um, that was also uh, there was always a mantra in Ukrainian politics next time next time therefore how do you also see this movement that there was no kind of a bigger larger support on the first hearing maybe would it create the more debates uh, where they, they are necessary and what, what also would you ask from the MPs to do next to make it better or? I think that that was basically the positive moment in the parliament that was just the first step to establish the land market in Ukraine because for long 19 years in a row, Ukrainian landowners have been deprived of the rights to freely dispose of their property. And I totally agree with Marianne that Ukraine remains the only democratic state in the world without a proper functioning farmland market. And also, what is more important, the farmland reform in Ukraine can bring additional $85 billion of economic effect in the next 10 years after the market launch, if we go with the more liberal, liberal model. So what are going to be next in the second hearing? You know, what are you planning to do also with the referendum? Because on the, in particular for our audience, of course, it's interesting because it's about the also international um, 
uh, companies coming. Um, so what are the next steps and what to wait? We'll see, because the legal language is just as important as the political language. You can, for example, say that land moratorium is about to be held in the next five years, and if it doesn't, so then something happens, and otherwise you can go there. Then, of course, you can sell it to foreigners or not. But I agree that it's uh, a dangerous playing field. Of course, we have to react in, since we are a democratic state, towards the will of the people. And there are unpopular, unpopular relatively unpopular sentiment towards foreigners. But I agree that in that sense, if we do it properly, then we can create a precedent, for example, to hold referendums whether foreign companies can extract gas or oil, or oil in Ukraine, which we actually desperately need, as not only for our energy security, but for our total security. And we need to work towards settling these issues in a way that satisfies the will of the people, the democracy, but also does not create uh, a political system in Ukraine which is relatively similar to Switzerland, where even uh, when, they held, when they hold 12 referendums per year, even for silly questions. Uh, Mark Ian, oh wait, so, sorry, uh, Volodymyr, my still question would be, so the, the question was for the Holos party, why uh, you, for instance, didn't vote for the first hearing and then later uh, suggest the amendments, but that's already happened. Uh, what do you suggest to do now? Would you go on abstaining? No, look, so, so we don't know what would be the final law, so therefore I cannot say how would, would we vote. So there are, uh, just uh, if we step back, there are two viable options of uh, land reform, of land market. First one is an uh, open market where everyone can buy land, of course with reasonable, uh, let's say, uh, restrictions for foreigners uh, related to security and related to, let's say, uh, uh, monopolies. And there is another version of the land market is, a, let's say, farming land market. And what we saw that there is an attempt to make something in the middle and that doesn't work. When you say, okay, we kind of create this kind of open market, but with restriction for some big players and with restriction without restriction for smaller players. So my point is that if we see one of these two options, we would be able to support. If you see something in the middle when uh, some players will, be, will have more preferences than other players, we would not support it. Do you engage the others into the discussion? Of course, we were in close contact with the Holos before the voting. I knew about their position, I knew about their trading, and we actually cooperated very closely before the vote. Mitro, you wanted to mention something? Yeah, basically comparing two economic models, let's say open market and uh, market with some restrictions that enables Ukrainian farmers to buy the land and to create all the access to finance, we recently conducted a study uh, and estimated economic effect of each of the model. And basically open market can bring $85 billion of economic effect, while model for farmers can bring only $30 billion of economic effect. And also we analyzed back in 2015, 60 countries all over the world on how they implemented the farmland market reform and what would be the economic effect of this farmland market reform. And the more liberal scenario can bring the biggest economic effect. And basically if you are talking about the referendum, another risky question that is in place right now, we cannot simply ask all the population of Ukraine on how Ukrainian landowners can dispose their property. We need so to ask 15% of the total population of Ukraine, which is 7 million of Ukrainian landowners, on how they can dispose their property. So we have with us also um, from uh, on Skype uh, Timothy Ash, who is the uh, economist and also working for the uh, sorry for the uh, uh, for the laser like who is a senior sovereign strategist on the emerging markets at the Blue. Uh, Bay Assess Management Company. Tim, do you hear us? Yeah, sure. Very so, good. Tim, I encourage, I'm just explaining, we have here the Marian Zablotsky, who is an MP from Servant of the People, Volodymyr Tsabal, who is MP from a Holos Party, and Mitro Livch, who is a project manager and the economist here in Ukraine. You had written on the land reform, you were following what's happening here. So, let us know what is your take on it, on the current voting, what are your concerns, but you also can ask and raise the questions to the uh, now Ukrainian politicians who will decide in the end. Yeah, look, firstly, congratulations uh, for the current administration for trying to push through land reform. I mean, this is uh, revolutionary. Uh, it it's, could be a, a wonderful positive for the country. I mean, I think this, this could really transform 
Ukraine if it's done in the right way? I mean, uh, several things. I mean, firstly, to making sure there's efficient allocation of, of land to those who are best able to use it, uh, consolidation of land plots, um, but also in terms of land sales. So, I mean, uh, you know, if you think about it, poor uh, rural inhabitants will be able, in theory, if you have the maximum number of purchase of land, you make the, the market for land as open as possible. You know, the potential for poor rural inhabitants to sell land and, and generate quite, quite significant returns for themselves, but also the state. The state is obviously a very big owner of land. And if you sell it and get a decent price for the land, the state's going to have uh, a huge revenue stream going going forward. I mean, I, I noticed the mention of $40 billion uh, earlier. I mean, it could be even beyond that. And, and uh, you know, this could be transformational for rural societies. It could be trans well, transformational for agriculture in, in Ukraine, transformational for rural societies, and also transform transformational for public finances. And I, I imagine if you get tens of billions of dollars through the sale of state-owned state land, I mean, that will help reduce the budget deficit. You can imagine some kind of sovereign, sovereign agricultural uh, wealth fund that could be used to, to, um, to invest those, those resources from land sale into rural, rural development going forward over you know, decades. It's a, a fantastic idea. Uh, but I just hope it's done in the right way. What I hear, or, or the slight, you know, the disappointment so far, has been restrictions on, you know, who can buy land. Um, I mean, I, I, I note the comments about, uh, you know, obviously there are, there are, you know, requirements or there should be requirements for national security to restrict, you know, certain ownership. I mean, in many other countries that is also the case. But I think you should make it as open as possible to have as many buyers of land as possible to bid up the price of land to make the price that you know, poor rural inhabitants get for land the highest and also that the state gets the, the highest possible price for land as well. So, um, you know, uh, I'm a little bit worried that the, uh, what I hear about the legislation passed at the moment, there are many vested interests trying to restrict uh, who's able to buy land. And, and I think a lot of the leaseholders that currently are doing incredibly well by being able to lease land very cheaply, I think they have a massive vested interest in, in trying to restrict the purchase of land as, and keep the price as low as possible. That's, the, that's pretty worrying, actually. So, Tim, please stay on, on, on the line and, and join. But I also want to ask also, uh, Marianne, what is going to happen with the referendum? What are planned? Can you also explain? Because, first of all, we, need, we are a bit tired to explain to the foreign audience why at all Ukrainians are not supporting that. But we understand that it's a years and years of the Ukrainian politics. But what, what, what will happen? And what would be your answer that this is not a full reform if the foreigners wouldn't make it? Well, I agree a lot with the respected economists, and my position is that uh, you, and purchase of the land should be open to anyone. We'll see what will happen towards the second reading. Because, yes, of course, since we are a democracy, we have to demonstrate that we consult the people. But secondly, we also need to understand that uh, we are talking about 7 million people who have private ownership towards the land. And it's their personal choice towards whom to sell and whom not to sell. What will happen in the end is that there will be some sort of legal language, which may be confusing, which may be difficult, and we can, which can actually mean any of two things. That yes, we can have the referendum, but in the end, this will, referendum will be either obligatory or not. It can be either, we either can have it, hold it in the next five years, or if we don't, then foreigners can buy land. And of course, there are different sets of restrictions, uh, because the reality is no matter how much you restrict foreigners towards buying land, you cannot do that technically or legally. Even now, foreigners can buy agricultural land. By the way, what, within your party, to be very sure, what, are the, what is the mood? So generally, how people think? Because we know also, though the party voted, it's not just you know, fully you know, bad because there are some people who are more concerned. I think we have a core that is towards the land reform in either, any way. And then we have mostly district MPs who were elected from rural areas, which are pressured by 20,000 or so farmers that do not want to pay for land that much. And they want as many restrictions as possible. But also we have a liberal wing, which says that we have to protect the 7 million private landowners and they need 
to get as better of price as possible. And that liberal wind is actually much more closely connected with Hollis Party, who, from my experience, at least previously wanted the same thing. So just to add, maybe it's not only 7 million actually uh, land uh, owners. It's also, let's say, uh, around 10 million households, around 30 million Ukrainians that do not have land. So what is in the best interest of those people? In the best interest of those people that economy grows. An economy would grow the best if the market is the most open as possible. I just want also to ask the position from your party, because uh, in the end we see today quite a huge uh, critics from some of the oligarch media, TV channels everywhere. There are the campaigns against the land reform that Ukrainian soil is sold. So in this environment, how you want to because now the party look like abstained, you know, but somehow you're supporting it. But for the public discussion, uh, that people just are confused. So uh, I think uh, the public discussion will, will continue, so we'll ha still have uh, some time to, let's say, to, uh, for people to understand uh, what exactly we want. But coming back to your question, let's say, in which case we would support. So now we have several, let's say, principal uh, things that are, let's say, more related to protection of the interest of, uh, let's say, of normal citizen uh, rather than uh, to some restriction. Because on restriction, we understand. There is a big discussion. There are some big, uh, let's say, fights. Uh, we'll be, of course, taking this, uh, participating in this uh, discussion, but uh, we don't know what, uh, what will happen. But in any case, what we really want, that in the final law, there is first access for normal farmers and uh, potential farmer to financing. So if, let's say, some person in Ukraine wants to buy that land and he doesn't have money, he should be able to buy that land. This is very important because if you open the market and there is no access to finance, then the only rich people will buy it. And then there is a second actually important thing is that uh, the proceeds from these land reforms, I mean the extra taxes and so on, they should go to the let's say, to the rural areas, at least big part of these proceeds, in order to develop those areas. Because other, other, other way around, we will kind of send, uh, sell land, but then the, no one knows uh, who, benefits, uh, who benefits from this, uh, let's say, uh, reform. What, how would you think that the, the, there are these ideas, and I will also ask later also Team, uh, team Ash to comment, he has some ideas on how the foreign bidders could be wetted if it's, some, if, if it's an issue of the national security. If you explain now, what would be your first, like, number one uh, de no, demand, and you know, demand, for instance, for the MPs? That they need to create a full liberalized market in Ukraine, which will drive up the farmland prices five times in the perspective of 10 years, because we are starting from the point of 1,500 per hectare. And the farmland market reform in Ukraine can bring the prices to the level of $5,500 per hectare which is like four times higher than in the existing uh, state of play. And also the reform should bring the biggest possible economic effect to the Ukrainian economy. And this money will be transferred to all the citizens of Ukraine and to livelihood of the citizens. So, Tim, uh, that would be the question to you. Uh, you hear the discussion. What would be also your suggestion? You mentioned these ideas. You know, you have some ideas who could, which can maybe improve the public uh, opinion towards the land reform, which had been created within the decades. Uh, and also, how do you think the Ukraine also, uh, Ukrainian society could be ensured that the um, that won't be the, the dangerous? Well, I mean, it's it's remarkable. We are we are where we are. Where I think uh, you know now now you know, quite a significant part of the population actually does want land reform. If you go back uh, for the last thirty years, politicians have told everyone that the population doesn't want land sales. I think it's about marketing it. I mean, this is a fantastic idea uh, for Ukraine, and it's simply a matter of the government getting out there and, and explaining to people what it actually means. I mean, it's it's clear that oligarchic television channels that have their, their owners have big stakes in terms of land leases already. They have no interest in a proper functioning land market. So you know, the government should go out there and tell people what it actually means. As I said, it means you know, poor rural people can get access, can, can, can sell the land, and, and if they get $5,500 per, per hectare, that's fantastic, right? Um, it, I, also, I mean, I, I think the, the previous person mentioned this idea that 
it's important that the revenues from land sales stay in rural areas. I mean, again, I think that's really important. And I think uh, I, I mentioned it already, but some sovereign land fund that all the revenues from land sales from state owned land goes to a development fund that can be plowed back into rural areas so people can see exactly you know what the benefit from uh, from selling land particularly well by the state is uh, and it just doesn't disappear in general budget financing um you know i mean many countries have sovereign wealth funds uh countries if you think about it in the middle east the, the biggest resource in the middle east is oil and gas so they create an oil and gas sovereign wealth fund and, and that's used for future generations in ukraine the biggest resource in ukraine is agriculture the land uh, so create a long-term development fund from land sales which will be used for development I mean, it, it could have tens of billions of dollars of, of finance in it you use for example to build schools in rural areas roads in rural areas send poor uh, rural people to university or overseas study there are lots and lots of things you can think to do with such a fund, but it shows the population in rural areas that they're going to be the big beneficiaries from this reform. It's, it's about selling, selling the story. And even in a referendum, I think, you know, if it's marketed in the right way, the politicians get out there and explain uh, the concept. I think, uh, you know, I think a majority of people would support it. So, Tim, thanks a lot also for the suggestion. My question would be the final question. We also have some um, um, other topics uh what do you expect next any kind of uh day set for the next for the second hearing do you give yourself any kind of a schedule i think there's relatively this uh, year next year roughly 50 50 percent chance that we will adopt the land reform by year end very likely i think it will still happen in uh, end of january beginning of november given the fact that there will be a, such a thing known in us as filibuster because there are different ways how we can twist the procedures in order to make the viewing of the legislation as long as possible. I think we will face that. But sec the biggest debate will be around the following. Of course, that we need to satisfy the democratic will of the people to limit the presence of the foreigners. But we'll also see the back drive towards me ma still making it as free as possible. On my behalf, uh, since there were a lot of politicians waging for a referendum not to allow foreigners to own land, basing their uh, opinion on the will of 72% of popular supporters, they say, I proposed openly in Parliament uh, a, a follow-up referendum, which can be held jointly, to nationalize the land of all the of, uh, former members of Parliament. Uh, and since it has 95% popular rating, I am very much willing towards uh, seeing how other MPs will react towards their property rights violated. So um, we probably are rounding up. Uh, so you know that was not much their debates because we really have the people from different parties who agree. Just maybe a final yeah. word. So I think the really time is important now. Timing is important. Yeah. So if uh, uh, this voting uh, was in. Uh, let's say September or even in August, so there would be no problem. I think the, the law would be passed very quickly. Now uh, you saw what happened, and if it is postponed for a longer period, we can expect uh, more, let's say, uh, a handicapped uh, land reform the later we kind of we will uh, do the second reading hearing. Yeah. And there is another very important thing that we need to discuss. It's actually the European Court of Human Rights decision. And the Committee of Ministers of Council of Europe will have this, will have this hearings uh, in the beginning of the, of the December on the farmland market reform issue in Ukraine. So property rights of Ukrainian farmland owners are credibly backed by the European Court of Human Rights. So I truly believe that this year we'll end up with the proper farmland market functioning in Ukraine. So thanks a lot for the discussion that was, uh, and I also say that's not over because we also had, uh, I had chance just a bit early in the very same studio talk to uh, Morgan Williams, who is the president of the US Ukraine Business Council and, exa and exactly raised the same um, issues, speaking on behalf of the also American and international investors. But that's still the government plan, for instance, to put this idea on the referendum. You know, they are supporting the land reform, which 
as I mentioned earlier, is long awaited, but that could happen. Um, what are you think the opportunities also? So how, how, how would you, do you talk with the Ukrainian government on that? That you know that should be treated differently, uh, and as well, what do you think this? What potential it opens? What's needed? Uh, you know that the re land reform really works. Well, for for, for uh, what we're trying to do, establish a land market. We're trying to give the people who own the land the rights to their property. It's very important for investment and business that you have the right to own property and you have the right to. To use that property. Right now the government has stolen that right from the people who own land for the last 28 years. It's not right for the government to say you can buy and sell your car, you can buy and sell your apartment, you can buy and sell your factory, you cannot buy and sell your land. That's totally wrong, it's totally counterproductive and it's cost Ukraine millions and millions of jobs and millions and millions of dollars worth of investment. What we're saying to the government, you can work out a compromise here. You can protect some of these uh, smaller companies. You can also bring in an, uh, uh, your large agribusinesses and protect them, all the investments that they made. But you can also have international investors. They bring the latest technology and seeds. They bring the latest farm machinery. They bring the, la the latest grade elevator. They, they bring the greatest, la latest marketing. They bring world-class technology. They bring money here. They're going to create economic value. They're going to create jobs in small towns. Everything is positive if you do it right. If they pass the land reform and do it wrong, they're really going to mess up things and they're going to make it worse than it is now. So it's, one, it's the most important piece of legislation for Ukraine. They need to get it right. They need to allow everybody to have a chance to play. And, in, and the international companies, they should be able to enlarge their presence over time. They are a positive for Ukraine. It is a great bonus for Ukraine if they allow international companies to come in here and work in the land market. It's nothing but a plus. What do you think, uh, what do you mean exactly by wrong? Not letting the international companies or something else? What are your concerns maybe regarding this piece of well, legislation? The big, big problem is there's not financing in Ukraine to finance land. So if you have 50 hectares and you want to buy another 50 hectares, financing is not really available. And uh, if you get some financing, it's for operating and it's very expensive. So the big problem is Ukraine does not have, has a terrible, I mean, a very weak banking system. They have almost a non-existent banking system or financial system to finance land. That's the biggest problem. So we have to figure out somewhere where you're protecting the smaller landowners, the smaller farmers, and help them have a way to finance if they want to expand. Then you have to make sure you just don't upset the, uh, totally destroy all the land, large landholders that are producing most of the crops in Ukraine. And you have to, there's a lot of international investors here now. The Swedish have been here in the Americans have been here, the Italians have been here, the French have been here. There's a lot of them here involved in agricultural production. And you have to remember that in the food system, the first half of the food system uh, is where you produce the food, the second half is where you process it. Eighty percent of all the money in food is made in the second half of the food system. People don't, it's not the first half of the food system where you have land and production. The money's in processing and in warehousing and in branding and shipping to supermarkets. So this huge uh, food empire that you have, 80% uh, of the money's in the second half of the food system, uh, not, not in the first half. So the full interview with Morgan Williams, who is the president of the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council, uh, is, would be and is available on our platform. So watch the full version because it's not just about the land reform, but how the Ukrainian and uh, business Ukraine is cooperating with the U.S. business in the midst of this turmoil connected to the uh, U.S. president impeachment inquiry, uh, where it's going, and as well um, what 
what exactly energy, what kind of exactly energy contracts uh, the U.S. had secured, why the Secretary Perry had traveled here to Ukraine to the President in uh, Zelensky inauguration. So way more details there. So go to en.romatsky.ua and we'll be back with the other topics. MH17 Joint Investigation Team published phone intercepts proving Russia's involvement in the Donbas war. The Bellingcats' Arik Tolle provides the details. At the six years anniversary of the Euromaidan revolution, Ukrainians show their solidarity with the Hong Kong protesters. So the recently released 2014 phone conversation between the Russian-backed separatists of the occupied Donbass and high-profile Russian officials like Vladislav Surkov, for instance, show further proof of Russia's involvement in the war happening in the eastern Ukraine. The joint investigative team uh, dealing with the MHA, MH17 uh, released the intercept calls. Uh, that was on November 14th. And we talked, uh, my colleague, uh, my, Maria Romanenko, earlier talked to the Bellingcat Eastern Europe and Eurasia lead researcher Alec Toller from the Bellingcat. Uh, and we see that this is just the tip of an iceberg that the team is building in f uh, before the trial. The new calls published by the JIT last week um, are really important in that the, they actually hear these things that we've known since 2014 from um, the mouths of some high-ranking Kremlin and um, DNR, LDNR officials. So you have Borodai, who's the who used to be the prime minister of the DNR, um, and Surkov, who of course is the presidential aide in the Kremlin, who are saying the things that we've known for years and years and years that the um, DNR is directly managed and financed and controlled by. Um, Kremlin actors. But it also shows that um, the situation wasn't super streamlined and easy to control because you had competing interests between the FSB, the GRU, the presidential administration, um, and the Ministry of Defense to some extent within the LDNR. So you had the FSB and the GRU working both with and against one another um, with the um, Donbass being kind of the playing field for their internal conflicts. Okay, so you mentioned some of the big profile names, of course, like Surkov. Um, but, and Borodai, but uh, it also mentions like some, some of the people in conversations are like this Vladimir Ivanovich or Sasha, like we don't really know who they are. And I saw on your Twitter then you talked about that you already have some sort of ideas about who this guy Vladimir Ivanovich is. Uh, could you tell a bit more about that, please? This Vladimir Ivanovich guy is definitely the, the most important person who's not been publicly identified yet because he clearly is a um, go between between. Um, the Russian Security Services and Ministry of Defense. I think he mentioned Shoigu um, at some point, and with the um, LDNR. Um, so yeah, he's he's the big fish, I guess, that the JIT wants to identify and um, get a hold of. And how do you think all this um, conversations and all this revelation, the information that we're receiving, is going to affect the upcoming uh, trial that starts in March 2020? There's no direct one-to-one -one connection between the downing. Um, and the conversations, but it does show further context and, um, and background information about how um, the Russian um, Ministry of Defense and Security Services were directly coordinating with and um, sending military equipment to the um, to the Donbas. And so that th this is oh, this would only be done, and the only reason why they would ever publish this information is because is if they later on wanted to build their case to include. Um, Kremlin and Russian security service officials in the um, criminal case because if there are many provisions within international law to where if um, some weapons were, were provided um, without proper um, instructions and safeguard measures, which obviously didn't happen with the book considering we're talking right now, um, then Russia could also be found liable for um, negligence of the military equipment and personnel that they provided that. Even if MH-17 shooting down, which, which is an act, was an accident, which it was an accident, they didn't mean to shoot down a passenger plane, um, Russian um, officials could probably still be held liable due to their negligence of uh, when they provided this military equipment without proper oversight. <laughs> At the six years anniversary of the Euromaidan revolution, Ukrainians show their solidarity with the Hong Kong protesters. 
So millions voted in Hong Kong in highly anticipated local elections seen the, as a barometer of public opinion after the months of increasing violent protests in this semi-autonomous Chinese territory. Uh, and uh, now we have with us uh, Artur Haritonov, who is the main coordinator of Free Hong Kong Center, which is now here in Kiev. Yeah. No, good evening, guys. So that's uh, incredible. First of all, probably for our audience who didn't follow much, uh, connect the dots. Uh, we knew something that, of course, the protesters from Hong Kong were looking at Ukraine. This is a symbolic uh, broadcast for us. Today, it's six years of the Euromaidan revolution. Let me explain us what you're doing, where is the connection, and what we need to know about this. Well, so let's... First, to say congratulations to all Hong Kongers who are watching right now because we have so far news that all Democrats won so many places on district elections right now. And coming to our topic today, yes, of course, connections between Ukraine and Hong Kong are so incredible and so strong because even from 2015, when we have a documentary film, uh, Winter on Fire, all Hong Kongers watched it and taking so many experience and passion to fight as Ukrainian. So. I think that here, first of all, psychological connections, spiritual connections, and we would, when we would co uh, compare what has been in the Euro Maidan and what do we have right now in Hong Kong, it's actually the same. How people are fi fighting, how government is reacting, and so on. So, uh, what is the main message also for foreign audience? You know, we see the, some uh, solidarity activities um, in front of the Chinese embassy here, but you won't say that the Ukraine is, as a state, is really like the allies of the protesters. Ukraine is in a number of international inner political crises now. So, um, but that's something that the, what the Ukrainians are doing as well. I mean, like, and what 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 also the. Uh, the protester from Hong Kong, from Hong Kong, are also asking, for instance, you. Well, so it's different points. When we are talking about people and support from people, of course, so huge and many Ukrainians in favor of Hong Kong protests. If we are talking about Ukrainian government, it's keeping silent. It's very, very weak. I think, first of all, because you know, it's my very strong position is that the current Ukrainian government is enjoying fruits of Yaromaidan and how they dare to keep it silent after we did before and which kind of democracy we protect. About Hong Kongers, of course, they're asking to save Hong Kong because it's under attack of China. And what, as Ukraine, we could do, it's first of all rise an issue on a UN level, because we remember how we, we, we was like six years ago, and like this, this spirit, like this, 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 this question to the world, please save us, please save Ukraine, as the same we have in Hong Kong right now. Let's explain our audience, because mm -hmm. among our audience, there are a lot of people who, first of all, interested in Eastern Europe. Um, explain what's similar, because for yeah. some people, you know, that there is just visual similarity. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are the, you know, either cocktail molotovs or people in masks, yeah. or the amount of people on the street. Uh, but what makes it... <laughs> very, very connected. I, I, I connected. catch your point. Like, first of all, it's masses of enemies, like... Russia, let's say, and Yanukovych, and Beijing, and pro Beijing parties in, in Hong Kong, because actually what we have seen even today during uh, election day, like the matters how they're uh, influence, influencing people, like uh, this bribing by food, by rice, uh, all these uh, different uh, bad points are they're doing during elections, how they're manipulating people. And of course, the reaction of Russia and Beijing on the protest. Because what do we have before? We have this like, strong position from Moscow that Ukraine is something horrible, we have no Nazi regime, and so on. And the same, Beijing is talking about Hong Kong people. But Hong Kongers are like taking a lot of experience from Ukraine, as I told, and they're trying to uh, make strong message that it's not true, it's just propaganda. So you established the Free Hong Kong Center. Of course, you are not alone. Let us explain how it's working and what's your aim. Well, so Free Hong Kong Center is a project of non-governmental organization, Liberal Democratic League of Ukraine. And like it's different points because we have LDLU as a quite big organization with uh, almost 200 people. And we have Free Hong Kong Center, which has like four or three people who are always day-to-day -day working with Hong Kong youth. And of course, for me, it's like very, very important po to work with it since I'm main coordinator of... Uh, 
uh, Freedom Con Center, and we are trying to uh, light on the issue of connections between Ukraine and Hong Kong, like how we was connected from 2014, because we remember that six months after, almost six months, when Revolution of Dignity ended, we have umbrella movement in Hong Kong. In even that time, it was very connected because people um, have been asking, like, if Ukrainians did it, we could do it as well. So, how are you in touch with the protesters in Hong Kong? What are the questions at this moment now? Because also Ukraine lived through the uh, this year. We don't do here at the Hermansky International, you know, the discussion on uh, what we have accomplished. It's more or less a general topic. Uh, but what are their questions? Uh, what knowledge they want from the Ukrainians? So, and what do they uh, want from also Ukrainians? Yeah. So, first of all, I think it's more about how you did it, like how you fight it, which kind of tools you used, because, you know, always when we are facing police brutality on, so, on such level, like a lot of Ukrainians who was on Maidan saying that even uh, Hong Kong situation is more uh, bad that we have in Ukraine, it's more brutal. So how we fight it against police, how we fight against government, uh, it's very important for Hong Kongers to understand, but uh, of course they're following news and uh, they're taking a lot of experience from uh, the Documentary I told Winter of Fire, and you know, like for example, Vladimir Prasuk become uh, like the symbol of Hong Kong protest because uh, a lot of Hong Kongers are posting the quotes from the documentary, like uh, before last days of Maidan, is that we must fight and uh, we must win because there are no life within the frames of unfreedom. So Hong Kongers want to know more about it. They and of course they are quite interested how Ukraine behaves after. European Maidan, because I think it's quite uh, pity that uh, Hong Kongers don't know a lot about further steps of Ukraine. Yeah. It's quite dramatic. But anyway, we are still on the way. And I'm always saying that Ukraine is uh, providing the next steps of the fight. So my final and short, mm -hmm. so you have this free Hong Kong center here, uh, and this is connection between Ukraine and Hong Kong, uh, the activists, the solidarity movement. Uh, you want the others to join because it's not just about these two countries? Uh, of course, and that's why we are dealing a lot on European level. Like just a few weeks ago, we got like uh, unmissly voting from all the group you swing for uh, Hong Kong support, and we are dealing all over the Europe, like our guys from Sweden, from Germany are doing some great job and we are rising the issue. You mean your guys, you mean the... the uh, no, not, not our guys, I mean like our colleagues, colleagues, liberal colleagues, and already we, like Ukrainian youth, rise an issue on Aldi level and EPP level. So I mean we have very strong resolutions there and I think it's so symbolic that Ukraine right now is fighting for Hong Kong as other countries fight for us many years ago. So, so thanks, a, thank you. thanks yeah. a lot. That was Artur Haritonov, the main coordinator of Free Hong Kong Center. Uh, maybe for somebody an unusual um, ending of our program, which we do at the sixth anniversary of the Euromaidan Revolution. It's five years since our English language project is existing. Uh, so stay tuned, support us. There is a lot to say uh, and explain from Eastern Europe. And now we see not just from Eastern Europe, uh, so we are there 24-7 uh, with you at the social media and as well on the webpage en.ua. Uh, as well, sign up for our weekly newsletter. With that, I say you thank you from the entire team of Hermatsk International.